us and pardons us. We're going to keep singing his praises.
just as we can come before our God and magnify his name, we can also come before him in all our helplessness and our need. Let's keep singing.
please pray with me. Father, we bow down before you, for you are Lord of all. Thank you that even in the mess of our life and in our sin, your arms are open to us. You lovingly welcome us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which has paid for our forgiveness for our sins. Father, please bless our night together. Amen. All right, take a seat. Welcome to church tonight. We are so glad that you have joined us. My name is Rach. My name is Luke. We are so glad that you are here. Thank you, Alex. Um, we are so glad you're here tonight. Um, it's going to be a great night. We're going to um, hear from 1 Corinthians 4, um, from Nigel. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we'll have Q&A like we normally do. So the slide, here we go, Slido. Um, you can go to that link there and ask your questions. Um, and I'll be asking some of those to Nigel later on. So Luke, what else is happening tonight? Yeah, tonight we have dinner, which is one of the best times of the month. Uh, so it's the first Sunday of the month, so we always go out and have dinner. Um, if you're a regular with us, it's $5 as normal. But if you're new, it's a great night to be here because um, we'd love to have you come out. We'd love to get to know you. Um, and if you are new, dinner's on us. Feel no need to pay. Um, but please come join us um, as we chat and get to know each other. Um, we also have some super exciting things happening over the next few weeks, and one of those things is our Nights Plus end of year celebration. Um, you maybe haven't heard of Nights Plus before. Um, Nights Plus is people who are about 25 and older, um, and we hang out um, and get to know each other in fellowship. Um, and we are going to be going to Sin Ives Bolo on Sunday, Sunday 26th of November. Um, and we just wanted to offer the invitation to anyone, especially if you are 23, 24, and want to find out um, what it looks like to be 25 older at Christchurch, please come along to this. Um, we'll be doing some bowling. We'll be doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyone's invited, so feel free to come along. What else do we have going on, Rach? Yeah, that's, I'm just so excited. I'm 24, but I might tag along. Um, we have next Sunday um, for, the, for the ladies in the building, um, we have um, at 4 p.m. downstairs in one of the lower halls, um, another week of women thinking theologically. If you don't know what that means, basically thinking about big things about the Bible, who God is, um, and we get to do that as women, which will be really cool. Um, so next Sunday, 4 p.m. downstairs in the lower hall, um, that'll be happening. Um, something's going to happen now. So last week, um, we got to hear from Nigel, a bit of wisdom as we think about the end of the year, which is crazy. It's November. How did that happen? But finishing the year well and starting the year well, we heard and had to think about um, giving and generosity and things like that. And Nigel is going to come up and share with us our second piece of wisdom. Oh, look out. I'm over 25, so that's, you know, there's got to be ways of wisdom somewhere. Evening, everyone. My name is Nigel. I lead the team here at Christchurch and Ives. And we do want you to finish this year as a Christian really well and start next year really well. If we don't start thinking about these things now, then once we get into December and January, then there's your brain explodes. There's so many things happening. You'll get to February and you're like, what do I do at church this year? So now is the time to think about it. As Rach said, last Sunday we thought about uh, giving and actually supporting the work. This week, I want to talk to you about joining the work. Uh, here at Christchurch and Eyes, we are on about our purpose, our mission is building wholehearted disciples of Jesus. We're working our way through 1 Corinthians at the moment, and we saw last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we are God's field, we are God's building, we are God's temple. Uh, we are an important part of what God does in gathering us together and using us for his glory. Uh, ultimately, what we would love to be doing as a church is to be training and equipping 3,000 people a week to go out and to reach love and care for the world. That's our ultimate goal. But we cannot get there without God's strength and God's power. And we cannot get there if we're all going to just be casual consumers of stuff that happens at church. We actually need to step in. We need to be people who are going to be committed contributors to the work. And that's what we're inviting you to do now is to prepare for next year and how you might actually join in the work. So let's watch a video that's been prepared to stimulate our thinking.
Hebrews 13, 14. It says, For here we do not have an enduring city, but we seek the city that is to come. I wonder how often you consider this. One city that is coming to an end. One city, one kingdom that will last into the depths of eternity. And here we are with one foot in each. When Jesus arrived on the scene, he declared the kingdom has come here. This gives us a choice, either live in a world that is ending or live in a world that is everlasting. So ultimately, the question is, will you live for the world that is to come to an end or for a world that will last? But you might ask, the kingdom is so big, so magnificent, what could someone like me ever do that would ever make a difference? And that's a great question. And even greater that the Bible tells us exactly what kind of difference we might make. And it's all the difference in the world. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, For we are God's handiwork, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has created us in Christ to serve Him, and He has prepared His church to serve Him by laying out works in advance. So when we serve God, we are doing what God made us to do. All this is to say that we want you to serve not the kingdom that is here now, but the kingdom that will last into eternity. So what could joining the AV team and helping with sound, maybe joining the band, or even helping welcome people to church do? You could do whatever our great God has planned to do. If you want to serve or think more about serving, please take a look at the serve form. Right, right now, I'd like you to look at your knees and then just look ahead of you and you'll find a little card that looks like this. If you didn't grab one of these cards last week, I'd love for you to grab, grab it this week and take it home, even if you're here for the first time. It'll give you an opportunity to actually check out what we're on about here at Christchurch and Ives. On the back, there's a QR code and a web address. Uh, they will both take you to a landing page that helps you actually get involved in supporting the work, joining the work. You'll be able to land at the serve form uh, that's right there. And as we just heard from Luke and others, what we really want for you guys is to be able to say, hey, I'm ready to step in. I'm ready to step up. I'm ready to serve God here in the midst of his people. There's a million ways you can do that. And, and we're ready to have all of you do that uh, for the glory of God. So have a think about what how you're going to finish this year well in your serving and how you're going to launch next year well and then fill in the form, let us know your thoughts. Uh, now, what I want to do now is actually for us to meet two people who have, been, who have been serving in different and particular ways and who next year are going to be serving in slightly different ways and that'll start to get really complicated if I keep talking. So let's just welcome Luke and Phil back on stage. Come on up. <laughs> Luke, come on here. Hey, so this year, Luke has been part of the ministry training strategy program that we run here at Christchurch. It's called MTS. And we've been so thankful to have uh, Luke as part of our program. Uh, Luke, tell us, what is something that you have just relished in this year? What, what have you enjoyed? What's been excellent? Yeah, um, it, to be honest, it's all been excellent. One thing I've really appreciated is um, doing MTS, you get to see um, all the ministries or at least most of the ministries going on in church. Um, and I feel like when I just saw a glimpse of what was God was doing just maybe at night's church, I kind of got it. But seeing how God works in the midst of every single ministry that in ways you would never think or never see outside um, of 6 p.m., but you see God is working powerfully to do um, what he has said he will do. It gives you great confidence and trust, and it really makes you realize this is a God worth giving your life to and worth serving because he is in the midst of this place doing amazing things, and that's just truly amazing to see, and I've loved it. Unreal, and we have loved working alongside you this year, Luke. It's been a joy to have you working in ministry, hands-on, doing some study on the side. It's been excellent. Uh, next year, what are you doing? I am heading off to more college next year. I'll do first year and we'll go from there. Good luck with that. Uh, it's going to be excellent, I'm sure. Hey, uh, Phil, this year you've been working as an engineer, but next year everything changes. Yep, that's the plan. <laughs> Phil's jumping on board doing MTS with us next year, which is really exciting. So let's give Phil some like shout out. Um, uh, 
our, our goal as a church is to be raising up lots of people to be thinking about full-time ministry, to be discerning whether or not this is for them. And we're really glad that Phil has stepped into this space to, see, to work with us for a couple of years, do some study and uh, work out just what should be next for her. She seeks to, seeks to serve God with your life. What are you looking forward to about the next couple of years? I've been thinking about this. I think I'm, I'm really looking forward to the time. Um, working full time and trying to serve in as many ways as possible. Um, I just find I either can't give as much of myself as I want to, or I try and then fail um, and just am not able to do a good job at all of the things that I want to do. Um, so I'm keen to have more time um, to serve God and his people and this church more. Um, yeah, and also for the things that Luke was talking about, seeing more of how everyone here is serving, getting to know um, more people here better and deeper um, and form yeah, relationships centred around Christ. Amazing. We're really looking forward to having you on the team. I'm sure you'll be better than Luke. So it was fun. Uh, we've loved Luke, but you know, every MTS who comes along is great. Uh, um, friends, uh, this work happens by virtue of our giving to this work to support these guys. Uh, we need to be able to fund the end of Luke's apprenticeship. We want to fund the first part of Phil's apprenticeship and we want to do that in the next 10 days so here is the night church challenge we want to raise 10k in 10 days to help luke finish well and to help phil start well do you see what i did there <laughs> for three of you thank you uh, that's great um so how can you be involved in the socials over the next 24 hours and via an email, you'll get information on how to actually contribute. You have to contribute in a special way to do this. It's not through our regular giving channels. It's through MTS themselves into a central fund from which we pay these guys. And so uh, that giving is tax deductible. If that is important to you as well, we would love to raise at least 10 grand in the next 10 days to help Luke finish well, to help Phil start well, and to boost us into next year in this work. And so I'm inviting you in to give. Whether you give $5 or $5,000, that is entirely up to you. If you want to give the whole $10,000 and have everyone else give as well, then that is also absolutely fantastically awesome. That'll launch us into next year uh, with great momentum. So let's do this together, 10K in 10 days. I'll give you some updates as we go along, and uh, let's see that we can resource these guys to serve the Lord strongly uh, into next year. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to have our Bible reading. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for Luke and for Phil. Thanks for uh, the work that they have already been doing uh, for your glory in this place, honoring you and for the uh, growth of your gospel. We pray and with thankfulness for Luke and all that he has done. Uh, we pray in anticipation and with thankfulness for Phil and all that she will do in the year ahead. We pray for us that we would be generous and be able to uh, meet this target and that we might be able to finish this year well and start well in supporting uh, MTS for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, grab your Bible. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm Regan. Um, I'm going to be reading our passage today, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praises from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? 
What do you have that you do not re- did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you had really had become to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at that, the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools it for Christ, sorry, that you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To those very, to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty, and we are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you, as my dear children, even if you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you did not, do not have many fathers. For you, in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent you, Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in the church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I will go find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? All right. Uh, friends, let's talk Taylor Swift. Uh, it, right now, she is the most astonishing phenomenon, I think, on the planet. Uh, if you have not heard of Taylor Swift, uh, she is the current big thing in rock, folk, rock, folk, folk, rock, pop, in pop, folk and rock music. There you go. And is currently on a world tour playing hits from all of her albums. And the big news of the last week is that her net worth just went over $1 billion. She is one of the most influential people on the planet right now. I did not get tickets to her concert. I did fly to Brisbane for the Reputation concert. I have seen the movie. Now, while you're just resetting your perceptions of me, let me tell you what I found fascinating about the movie. Two things. So the movie is a movie of her actual concert, right? Of the concert that's currently playing around the world. Two things that fascinated me. Number one, she spends a lot of time talking to the crowd. Like, I think almost disproportionate to how much music is being played. But when she's talking to the crowd, it's like when she's singing a song, they're like, ah, but when she's talking, it's, it is dead silent. And every single person there is listening to every single word she is saying. They're hanging on every word. I've, I've just found that phenomenal. 100,000 people in a stadium silent. Well, what's second that is fascinating is the content of what she says. And at one point she says words to the effect of this whole tour and all the effort that we are going to here is to honour you, is to please you. It's to make you happy and to give you a great night out. And she makes it clear through the whole concert that she's giving all she can for her audience. And she does so the next night and the next night and through the current tour, which is 146 nights and will end up being the biggest grossing tour of all time by a long way. Indeed, it feels like at the moment that the entire world is her audience and her life is being lived entirely to please that audience. 
Now, of course, we're all living to please some audience, aren't we? We're all living for something or someone. Sometimes it is the whole world. Sometimes it's our family. Sometimes it's a close friend or a spouse. Sometimes it's actually ourselves. And the spirit of our age says to your own self be true. We're all living to please someone. So who is your audience? Who's your audience? Who are you living to please? For whom are you actually living your life? Well, did you notice if we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul actually answers that question in verse 1. Grab your Bible, have a look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. He says here and makes it clear who he is living for. He says, This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Do you see it? Do you see what he says? Paul is playing to an audience of one. And it's not the Corinthian leaders, and it's not Apollos, and it's not Cephas, and it's no one else who's living and breathing upon the earth, not even himself. He says clearly, I am a servant of Christ. I'm a servant of Jesus. And as a servant of Jesus, he says there in verse 1, he's not only living for Jesus, but he's been entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 2, and we saw how this mystery revealed is actually Jesus Christ crucified. Now, it was a previously a grand secret before Jesus walked into the world, before he was born and walked upon the world, previously a grand secret that God had a gracious plan to actually send his son into the world to die for the world and reconcile the world to himself and invite people to trust him and welcome people into eternal life and paul says now that plan has been revealed well those words are in our mouths and we are working as servants of jesus to tell the world and so this is how you should think about me i play to an audience of one i just live for jesus and I'm just doing what Jesus has asked me to do. I'm a servant of God, sharing the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus with the world. And this whole chapter is really his concluding thoughts then, in response to all that's already been said, his concluding thoughts to their arrogance and argumentative attitudes. And he's going to make it clear that he has no interest in impressing them, but he has every interest in honouring the one who has given him the message of Christ and the one who will judge all things. Paul isn't going hunting for compliments on his sermons. Paul's not wandering around hoping that people will compliment his strategic plan. Paul just wants to please Jesus with his life. And at the end of it, he wants to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. So with this in mind, Paul's going to flesh out what it looks like to play to an audience of one as he goes about his ministry. And then he's going to urge the Corinthians, whether they're in ministry or not, to imitate his life. And what I'm going to do at the end of tonight is urge you to imitate Paul and to just live for an audience of one. So let's get stuck in and see what Paul uh, has to say and what all this looks like as he plays to this, to plays just for Christ. And the first thing he wants the Corinthians to see is that the task of ministry is faithfulness to God. Is the task of ministry is faithfulness. Look with me from verse 2. He says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Now, you could mistake Paul's words here for arrogance, but they're not. I think his words actually beautifully capture the purpose of his life. Faithfulness to God, because God is the one who will judge him in the end. Now, the judgments made about his methods by the Corinthians, the judgments made about his gospel by the Corinthians, the judgments made about his person by the Corinthians, he says are of little consequence to him because God knows all and God sees all and God will judge all and it's therefore God who matters. He says he doesn't even judge himself because sort of setting your own standard and therefore trying to please your own standard is to forget whose servant you ultimately are. 
Now, he doesn't mean there's no place for self-discipline. He doesn't mean there's no place for self-reflection or self-examination, but rather that his ultimate goal in life and ministry is not set by him. And it's not judged by him. And it's not at his commendation. His conscience is clear because he's seeking to serve the Lord. It doesn't mean that he's innocent. It just means that that's where he's headed. He's focused. He's constantly aware that the Lord who bought him is the Lord who loves him and is the Lord who calls him to serve faithfully. That's Paul. The Lord who bought him is the Lord who loves him, is the Lord who has called him to serve him faithfully. And can I say that there's something so freeing in this for those who would dare to be in ministry? There's something so freeing in this for those who would dare to do any ministry, actually, whether you are part of a kids' church team or a youth team or an AV team or Connect team, whatever team that you're a part of, there's something really freeing about what Paul says here. And this is it. It's actually that... And I'm sorry if this is a disappointment to you, but my goal is not to make you happy. That's not why I'm in ministry. That's not why I lead the church. My goal is actually not to make you happy. My goal is to please the Lord and to be faithful to him and to him alone. And one of the greatest tragedies in ministry is when someone leads in pursuit of the praise of people. They lead so other people will go, wow. You're amazing at that. They lead so people go, wow, will you come and do that for me over here? They lead so they can get people's praise because whereas people pursue the praise of others, what happens is they they tone down the call of the gospel. They tone down the call for holiness. They silence Jesus in pursuit of the voices of the crowd. And Paul says, don't do that. (laughs) Indeed, it's, it's freeing just to serve Jesus and, and, and actually, to try not to worry what other people say, but just to be honourable to Jesus. And the task, therefore, to, is to God to be faithful, because we live alone for him, Paul says. But that's not all. Uh, verse 5, uh, Paul says, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, I'm just going to pause on verse 5 for a minute because I just want to make sure that we all know how to read the Bible properly. Uh, I have had verse 5 quoted at me several times when I have challenged people about living a godly life. I sort of open the scriptures and I'll say, hey, you cannot live your life by that, like that. You, you need to honour Jesus in the way you live your life. And people say to me, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says, judge nothing. You're judging me. You're not allowed to do that. Bible says so. My answer to that is, have you actually read 1 Corinthians? Because we always need to read any part of the Bible in the context of the whole. You can't just take one verse out and make a verse say what you want it to say. You actually need to read the Bible in the context of the whole. And and if you actually read from the start of 1 Corinthians, as we've been doing, you'll notice that Paul started judging people back in chapter 1, verse 10. And he's been on about it back at it in chapter 4 verse 8 just wait till you check out chapter 4 verse 21 and just wait till next week when we get to chapter 5 verse 1 it's really this whole book is just going to get off the charts and 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 so Paul is not saying here you can never call someone to account for godly living because he does that continually what he is saying is don't write off a Christian leader because they're different to you don't write off a Christian leader because they they do ministry differently to you Don't write off a Christian leader because their style is different to you. Don't write off a Christian leader because they have an interest in in the writings of this person or that person which might be different to you. He's speaking again to the factionalism inside the Corinthian church. And it's why at the end of this verse, he points them back to God. Look at the end of verse 5. It says there, at that time, at the end of all judgment, each will receive their praise from God. Because it's the praise of God that matters. And that's why he serves only an audience of one, seeking to be faithful to all that God has called him to do. That's not all that Paul says here, of course. Secondly, he wants them to be reminded that the context of ministry is a world that actually despises the gospel, despises gospel workers, and calls us fools. So the context of ministry is to be called fools. I'm going to read from verse 8 again. 
Now look with me from verse 8. It says, Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You've begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so strong. We, you are honoured and we are dishonoured. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We're brutally treated. We're homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We've become the scum of the earth. The garbage of the world. Right up to this very moment. Now, I just wanted to read all of that again because it is such a gloriously true picture of what the world really thinks of those who proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just a true picture of what the world really thinks of those who, who call people to repentance and faith. Oh, the world, the world will love people who preach a gospel of good deeds. Christians should go and, and do lots of good things. The world will love those sorts of preachers. Now, the world will love the sort of preacher who says, just love people. Stop, stop telling people to repent. Just love people. The world will love those sorts of preachers. Uh, those who proclaim the mystery of Christ now revealed. Those who proclaim the need for the death and resurrection of Christ. Those who proclaim the need for our sins to be forgiven for repentance and faith. Well, they will regularly be made a spectacle of. And persecuted. And condemned and mocked as fools, and cursed, and persecuted, and slandered. And I can show you my inbox sometime if you'd like proof. The language at the end of that little section there in verse 13, where Paul describes himself as scum of the earth and garbage of the world, could literally just be the contemptible off-scourings of the body. I want you to imagine you did a Duke of Ed hike that went for five days in the rain and mud and sun and dry and rain and mud, and then you got home and you hadn't showered and you hadn't actually done any bodily hygiene for five days and you just scrape everything off your body with a brush. That's how Paul's describing himself as what's scraped off. That's how the world views him. Now, of course, much of that sounds alien to our ears and our experience, doesn't it? But is it that because Paul's assessment of the world is wrong? Or is it that ministers and churches they lead don't live in noticeable contrast to the world around us? Such that the world might even be able to comment that we're different. Is it that we are so same, same with the world that the world doesn't even notice us anymore? Is it that we are so silent about the crucified Messiah? Is it that we are so silent about the need for people to trust Christ or face hell? That is that the world doesn't even notice us anymore as we sit in the comfort of our couches, relishing his goodness, but rarely speaking of the destiny of the masses or of a call to holiness. Well, the task is faithfulness to God in the context of a world that will call you foolish if you follow him. As you live for an audience of one. Now, that's not all Paul says here. Finally, among all the other things in this last section, Paul reminds them that the future of ministry is actually finite and in the hands of the Lord. You, you only serve in ministry for a short amount of of time. Paul knows his time is short. He knows his days are numbered. He knows he can't do it all and he cannot be all things to all people at all times and forever. And so he says from verse 17, he says, for this reason, I have sent to you, Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon. If the Lord is willing. You see, Paul only does anything he does if the Lord is willing. 
He knows right now that he can only do what he can. He's got a humble estimate of himself. He's sending Timothy because he can't be everywhere all the time. He can't be around and won't be around forever. He knows that he can only do anything if the Lord is willing. And he wants to go to them and he wants to love them and he wants to challenge them and, and he wants to be able to, to speak to them, call them back to the Lord. But he knows that it's all in the hands of the Lord, that all his plans are only subject to the Lord's will and that the, that the Lord will take him away from them when he is ready. So Paul's future is not in his hands. It's not in the Corinthians' hands. And so he knows now's the time for action. He knows now is the moment for holiness. He knows now is the moment to be calling them to account. He knows now is the moment to follow Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Because there may not be another moment. And so where do we get to in chapter 4? Bringing all this together. He's saying here the task of the minister. The task of those who would be in ministry is faithfulness to God. In the context of a world that calls you foolish. And that you might pursue that with all your heart's passion for as long as the Lord gives you because you must live to an audience of one. Now, as you hear those words, I suppose you might be thinking to yourself, oh gosh, phew, I'm glad I'm not Luke or Phil going to ministry. That's a nightmare as if anyone would want to do that. Well, just look with me at verse 16. What does Paul say here? I urge you to imitate me. See, in the context of these chapters, he is urging them as their spiritual father to imitate his passion to live his life completely in light of the cross. He is urging them to live life in light of the Lord's approval alone. Whether they're in ministry or not, he's urging them to live life in light of the reality that the audience that matters for your life is only Christ. He's saying, live life faithful to God in a world that will call you foolish, but do that passionately with every moment he gives you. He's not expecting them all to be the same as him or do the same as him. He's not calling everyone into ministry. He does expect, however, that their focus and their attention in life will be on the same person as he has. He is expecting them to play to an audience of one, and that one is Jesus. They may not be in ministry, but the call is still on their lives. Verse 16, I urge you to imitate me. I urge you to live a life faithful to God in a world that will call you foolish and to do it passionately because your time is short. Use every moment that you have. And that is what Paul did. And that's what he urges them to do. And I tell you, to the very best of my ability, that is what I am seeking to do. And I fail regularly. I get back up and I keep going. And to the very best of my ability, I want to urge you tonight to do the same. To live faithfully just for God, not for anyone else or anything else. To live your life to an audience of one. To live to please just one. For it's the Lord who matters. It's the Lord who judges. It's the gospel we need to hear. And our time is short. For whom are you living? Really? Now friends, I think this is a word that we need to hear here and now. Because I reckon... There are some of us, even many of us, who may not actually believe that living for Jesus is actually best in the world. The reality is, of course, that life is never better when you live for the praise and honour of Jesus. But we Christians spend so much time sitting on the fence, wondering, Do I follow Jesus on this or do I follow my heart? Do I follow Jesus on this or do I follow my friends? Do I follow Jesus on this or do I follow my family? Do I follow Jesus on the way I use my body or do I follow the streams of the world? Do I follow Jesus in the way that I use my tongue Or do I follow my family and friends and workplace? 
Do I follow Jesus in the way that I use my money or do I follow my, my family's traditions and those things? We could go on and on. There are so many options in the world. There's a smorgasbord of life before you every day that sort of says, no, make your own choices. <laughs> Jesus is just one of the choices, but you feel free to choose whatever works for you. There are so many options in the world. Is it really worth going all in with Jesus? I want to urge you tonight. And I want to say clearly to you tonight. It is absolutely worth it. When you go all in with Jesus, you will find joy amidst life's griefs. You will find confidence amidst life's uncertainties. You'll find purpose amidst life's mysteries and peace amidst life's anxieties. Who wouldn't want all of that and more? And if your desire is for the approval of the world or the approval of your family or the approval of your friends or, or even to just please yourself, can I tell you that you're not only backing the wrong horse, but it's going to come and bite you in the butt at some point in time. And not only that, but you are deeply betraying the cross of Christ. For it is there at the cross that God reconciled you to himself and called you to serve him. It's there at the cross that God loved you and called you to serve him. It's there at the cross that God forgave you and called you to serve him. It's there at the cross that God redeemed you and called you to serve him. It's there at the cross that God saved you and called you to serve him. So why do we dare to accept his kindness in restoring us to glory and then ignore the king of glory? So when it comes down to it tonight, I just want you to be honest. For whom are you living your life? I want to tell you that the wise, they play just to an audience of one. And that one is Jesus. Let's pray. Our great God and heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your mercy that is ever toward us. Our Lord God, I really ask that on this night you would help us to be honest with ourselves and honest before you. Lord God, help us to be people who re receive from you and who serve and follow you. Help us not to live for anyone but you. Give us clarity and energy for this courage and a community that will help us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, we're really used to singing about how great our God is and we so willingly accept his kindness. But let's keep our eyes fixed on him and on to eternal glory that he gives us so freely. Please stand and join us.
I hope it's the right placement. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Grisha. I'll be praying for us. So please bow your head and pray with me. Father, thank you that you have revealed the mystery of your plan, that in Christ at the cross you are reconciling all things to you, and that you have loved us and called us to serve you. So we pray that you would convict us to be faithful to you, to your word, to your plan, and that we may live passionately for you, knowing that ministry and life is done only to you. As your son said, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. May this be the pattern of our own self-sacrificial ministry, that we wouldn't serve or lead for our own glory or praise or status like the world says we should, but that it would be in a humble service of you and others. So may your spirit work in us, that we may exercise our skills and gifts freely, such that the ministry of your word flourishes. And Father, I we particularly pray for those thinking about ministry next year. Uh, thank you for convicting many hearts to serve you. And we pray for wisdom and good conversations that they may know where best to serve you here next year. And Father, we also pray for the kids and youth ministry here. Thank you for the staff and the volunteers that put hours of effort into preparing and leading um, programs for kids and youth here. Thank you for their relational care for those that they lead. Thank you for the connections that they build with the families here and the community um, feeling that they foster. And we pray that many would come to know who you are and what you've done for them um, through these ministries um, and that those who already know you would continue to nurture and flourish in their faith. Father, we also pray for our mission partners, the Tyler family, who are going to Vanuatu next year to, Bible, to do Bible training for the local believers there in their own languages. Thank you for the time that the Tylers had away recently, um, the rest that they were able to have there. Um, and we pray that this is setting them up well for um, their final few language assignments and incentives that they're doing in Melbourne currently. And I just pray as they pack up and move back to Sydney for the rest of the year that it will be smooth and that they would settle back to life here well, uh, and that would give them a good foundation for going to Vanuatu next year. Finally, God of the nations, whose kingdom rules over all, have mercy on our broken and divided world. Bring peace in our time, O Lord, in the land of our Saviour's birth. Banish the spirit that makes for war. Please give wisdom to those you have placed in authority. Rescue the captives, shield those in danger, and bind up the brokenhearted. For those fighting for justice, please turn their hearts to seek peace and strengthen them by your grace. For those walking in darkness, may the light of your face shine upon them. Above all, we pray that the peoples of Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East will find everlasting hope in you. And in the land of your son's redeeming death and resurrection, turn hearts to look to the Saviour and live. Bring peace, Lord, while we wait for Christ's coming and rule, when all people will beat their swords into plowshares, when nation will not take up sword against nation, and when every tear will be wiped away by the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Alrighty, uh, it's time for Q&A, so I'll give you a second to just open up to slido.com and you can upvote your favourite question. Um, while I have a chance to do that, Nigel, I'm curious, do you have a favourite Taylor Swift song? Oh, do you know, I knew that, I just knew this would come up. <laughs> I have lots of favourite, I mean, I think I'll just go the whole, I love, this is so weird, isn't it? Anyway, I think the Reputation album is actually... Excellent. And uh, there's a lot of shaking heads over here. Oh, sorry, Peter. 
Uh, anyway, I, I've, I have listened through to the new 1989 twice. Um, it's getting sadder. Um, but uh, but I, I think the new version is better than the old version. Uh, I, there are a few songs on Reputation that I use as sort of exercise psych-up songs if I'm feeling, not feeling it. I'm not going to lie, this was a much longer answer than I anticipated. <laughs> I thought I'll it's give them a couple seconds to just kind of like upvote. And we'll, yep, no, but I'm go. glad we all know your Look. thoughts on Taylor Swift now. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let's get into some slightly more important questions probably. Um, so the first question, um, the top voted question at the moment is from Sam, um, which says, you mentioned judging righteously. Oh, it's just moved. Um, but in Matthew 7 verse 1, um, Jesus says, judge no one. Where is the line between righteous and unrighteous judgment? Yeah, excellent. Uh, open up your Bible, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a really important passage. I think that it's um, uh, helpful for us to um, uh, just get our head around. Um, so Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Do not judge or you too will be judged. So the first thing to note is that Jesus doesn't say don't, pass judgment on others. He just says, look out if you do pass judgment on others because you too will be judged. And, and uh, if you look down at verse 5, his, his actually rebuke of the people who he's speaking to is, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So again, he's, he's not saying don't judge. He's saying be actually in the right place with God be to, to fix yourself first and to be humble before God and repentant before God and seeking to live for God and honour God with all that you are and all who you are uh, before you actually do the work you know, of pointing things out to other people. So again, verse 5, really clear, isn't it? Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So actually, Paul expects us to be helping others to have specks and logs removed from their own eye, but not from a hypocritical position, but actually from a humble position, where you actually stop and pause and you say, actually, I, I need the rebuke of the gospel as much as anyone else. And so, so where is the line, was the precise question then, is... Yeah, where is the line between righteous and unrighteous judgment? Yeah, so I think if you come uh, into a conversation with someone where you are humble and curious and pursuing in your own life to keep in step with the spirit and that is to honor him uh, with your life and you do that uh, humbly and carefully and gently with a friend i think absolutely um, i think if you sort of come at someone and you're sort of like hey you should be behaving in that way and Rrr! and and you're hypocritical because you're behaving in the same way or in other ways and you're just trying to sort of have a one-up over someone else i think that's really not the way we ought to take it. So I would, I would say if you are repentant, humble, curious, and gentle, that would be a great way of approaching someone uh, um, in terms of helping them grow in godliness. Yeah, so kind of that recognition of yourself and your sinfulness so you can then talk to other people but recognising you're both sinners. Yeah, absolutely. God. Yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, our new top questions from Angus um, it says, what does it look like to lovingly confront non-Christian people of their sin and need for God? Yeah, um, I, I think that th this, is a great com this is a great conversation starter for dinner, I reckon. Uh, but, but I'll share some thoughts. I, th I think it would be excellent. And I know there's been some conversations around this week um, ab about how to do that really well. Um, I, I think it's best done in relationship with people. I'm not saying that, you know, you need to sort of get to know someone and, and don't reveal you're a Christian for six or nine months and then sort of spring on, by the way, I'm a Christian and now I've got things to tell you. But actually it's best done as someone knows you and knows your passions and priorities. What I, what I found, and I still find today, even at the age that I'm at, is that as people get to know me and they know my passions and my priorities, because I speak of those things. I speak of what I do in life. I speak of, you know, that I go to Bible study and I do this and I do that. And, I, you know, these are the things that happen in my life. It's actually in that context that people in the end who are friends will say to you, why? And, and there provides you the non-confrontational 
context to be able to do that. I think um, if, if you are friends with a group of people and they don't know you're a Christian, if you're friends with a group of people and they don't know that you take Jesus seriously, if you're friends with a group of people and, and you um, end up being the sort of, you know, narky, judgy Christian on every single thing that's going on, it's always going to be confrontational. But if you are just yourself as a Christian and just in the normal running of life, uh, that you would actually meet Christians, pray for Christians, that you'd have an opportunity to actually just share your worldview with Christians, that, that you would have an opportunity to share from the Bible or your own perspective on something. You'll find that as you just take that sort of pattern and pathway of, you know, meet, pray, listen, speak, that that little pathway will actually help you have non-confrontational conversations. Nice. Thank you. Um, our last question is from Steph, um, which says... How can we live in contrast to the world and still keep relationships with non-Christians? Um, so very similar in the non-Christian path. Um, how can we keep those relationships with non-Christians who see us as foolish and are put off despite being shown love? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say is that sometimes you can't. Sometimes even to the very best of your ability that a follower of Christ will be the stench of death in in the nose of those who don't want anything to do with Jesus. So I think it's important we don't necessarily blame ourselves all the time when uh, when when we you know don't have the opportunities when friendships explode or something else like that. Um, how do you continue to pursue those friendships? I, I think you actually just remember that the goal of your life is to live for an audience of one. And so when you engage with those friends you engage with them as a Christian person in those friendships and you love them and care for them and there'll be boundaries where they may do things that you will not do. They may watch things that you will not watch. They may speak in language or speak about people in ways you will not speak about and where you'll have to make choices as to whether you just exclude yourself from that portion of the conversation or exclude yourself from the whole thing that's going on in that friendship at that point in time. And that will be hard. But actually, if you are upfront about the fact that you're a Christian in the friendships that you have, there's actually a point at which your friends will expect that. And as you love them and show love to them and engage with them and are interested in them and, and pursue them as friends, as individuals and in a group, I think you'll find that people actually will have a growing level of respect for you when you actually step out or stay silent and yet remain in contact with them and love them as you go on with that, because they'll actually recognize that in you there is internal consistency and integrity. And if there's anything that our world wants today, it's integrity. So if you can be a person of integrity and stay in relationship individually and together with each of the people, I think that you might find that therein lies gospel opportunities and therein lies growing friendships, even with unbelievers. That's not easy. But if you think, uh, I'm playing to an audience of one and I'm living with integrity in that space, I think there you'll see growing friendships. Yeah, it's not easy. And if that's something that you maybe find really difficult or you feel quite isolated in trying to figure out how to do that well, this is a great place to not go through that alone um, and to chat with Christian friends who are probably going through very similar things yeah. um, if we're living for Jesus. Um, well, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll sing after that. So please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus. Father, thank you that he died once and for all, for all sin. Father, um, I pray that this mercy that you have shown us and given us is not something that we simply take and then continue to live our lives the way that we want to live them. Um, but that your spirit will be convicting us of the need to live wholeheartedly and fully for Christ. Um, Father, I pray that when this is hard, um, you will be encouraging us by your spirit and by your word and from those around us to continue to live for Christ. Um, Father, I pray that um, we give everything to Jesus and that um, we can celebrate with you in glory that we have fought through um, the brokenness of this world when Jesus does return. Amen. Amen.
Well, as we head off in our weeks, we've been encouraged tonight to have our gaze fixed on Jesus, to play to an audience of one. And this next song has a lyric that speaks to that, that we would fix our gaze on Jesus' face. Please stand and join us.
Well, we've been encouraged tonight to live for an audience of one, but we've also been reminded that Christ came and he lived for us as he went and he died on the cross. And so maybe as we head out to dinner, we could talk about what it looks like in our lives to live for an audience of one while remembering what Christ did for us. So good. If you've joined us online, thank you so much for joining with us tonight. We'll see you next week.